Uh, now, about first of all about the Faculty of Health. This is the faculty that you have joined and as an honorary professor, we'd like to tell you that uh, since 2008, the faculty has increased its student load by over 50%. Uh, and we've added a number of very important courses related to workforce shortage. So we've added a Bachelor of Midwifery, we've added a Bachelor of Public Health, we've added a Master of Occupational Therapy, and a number of other courses, and more are planned for next year. But I'll save that for when you come back and talk to us again. Our research students have increased from three to 80 over those three or four years. And our research income has also increased, so much so that last year we had the highest uh, dollar value of contracts signed of any faculty in the university. So we've come a long way and because we have um, had some very nice funding from the Department of Health and Ageing, we also have things like the mobile clinic that runs down on the far south coast and provides an opportunity for rural clinical placements. So we like to say that the Faculty of Health is truly on the move. We are also very pleased to hear this week that in HHF4, the University of Canberra, in a collaborative grant uh, shared with the Australian National University and led by the Southern General Practice Network, has been awarded $31 million towards improved service delivery, clinical training and integrated e-health capacity on the far south coast, uh, in Biga and Maruya and also in Cooma and that will provide accommodation for students and staff on clinical training as well. So it's a very exciting time, and we're very appreciative of the support from the department, and we're very appreciative that the department has lent us Jane for a short time today. On a personal note, Jane and I share some very early history. We had our first jobs together in the Research School of Social Sciences, in an interdisciplinary, policy-relevant team on a project called the Ageing and the Family Project. I had my mind firmly set on an academic career, although I didn't actually not do that, but I had a clear trajectory. But Jane, although she was in a university appointment, had a firm and quite clear future plan to become a public servant, to have a career of public service. Indeed, it was Jane that made me realise that being in the public service wasn't about having a job. It was about having a career. And she taught me that when we were both a lot younger than we are now. <laughs> so Jane actually took the research skills that she was developing in the research school and moved into a, a kind of related role in the Australian Bureau of Statistics. She took those policy, policy skills that we were both developing uh, after that and moved into the frame of the Department of Health and Ageing and in the years after that had a number of positions which I can't possibly cover. She did a stint in the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet, a really important thing for any aspiring public servant to do, as the uh, Executive Coordinator with responsibility for advising the government on all social policy issues. So she brings a lot of breadth to us today. In January 2002, she was appointed as Secretary of the Department of Health and Ageing. And I realised, as I was thinking about this introduction, that she's had, uh, she's made the 10-year mark in that role. In, uh, Jane also holds a number of national and international committee positions, which are literally too many to um, describe. In my view, she is the most experienced and one of our most valuable senior bureaucrats, and certainly the most senior female bureaucrat in Australia. I'd like to present to you now adjunct professor Jane Halton to talk to us about Australia's preventive health approaches to tobacco and chronic disease. And I'd also like to thank the wonderful Joan Corbett for all of her organisation today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Diane. And can you all, can you all hear adequately? Enough volume? Big voice. Big voice? No, it doesn't. Yeah, yeah I, I, I was thinking as Diane, who does have a smallish voice, I'm sure her daughters don't think so, um, that it wasn't very loud. Is that better? We're no? Actually, we're not actually broadcasting, though we are recording. So ah, okay, so I'll just bellow. I do bellowing well. 
some of you may know that I taught aerobics for 20 years, so if I, if I get my aerobics voice on, it will probably work for us. Can I also start by acknowledging the traditional owners, elders past and present? Uh, it's an important tradition which I think we observe and uh, it is also my uh, privilege to acknowledge any Indigenous people who are with us. It's a particular pleasure to talk to you today and I could talk to you for hours and hours and hours about all sorts of things to do with health. It's a question of what in basically an hour uh, we can talk about which might be of a bit of an interest. And when we were talking about what I might talk about here, really the public health agenda uh, and some of the things that we engage with globally, it struck us might be things that would be of interest uh, to all of you. I could go on and on about HHF and what we're doing on training and uh, what we're doing in terms of health reform, but acknowledging that time is short, we'll focus today at least on some of the global public health issues. I'd also like to acknowledge that the University of Canberra, as, uh, as Diane says, has really come along in leaps and bounds uh, in both its, uh, its training efforts, but also its engagement with the community. And I think the uh, HHF project and I will tell you that I am a member of the board of the HHF. I declared a conflict of interest and stood aside uh, when this project was uh, in its precise consideration. But the project that Diane just mentioned to you I think is a really significant project for that continuing engagement and indeed uh, I know while sometimes difficult the uh, important partnership that will be had with the ANU as we uh, extend the academic reach of institutions in the ACT out beyond the borders into places where services need to be delivered. But that's possibly for another day. What I'd like to do uh, today is to talk to you about what actually happens uh, in terms of our global engagement we do a lot of work as a small to medium power in the global environment and it's one of the things which I think we have as a very proud tradition in this country that not only do we have a really pretty good, in fact you could say genuinely excellent health system, notwithstanding what you see on the front page of the Daily Telegraph occasionally, uh, that our system delivers great outcomes. It can always be better, which is why we're doing health reform, but it's also part of our proud tradition that we do engage globally uh, to be a good citizen, but also to show leadership in areas that we think are important. It's been my privilege to be the president of the World Health Assembly. Uh, it's also been my privilege to serve, uh, in fact, now for a second occasion on the board of the uh, executive board of the WHO. And we do that because not only is it important that we work with our colleagues globally, but it's also important that we engage with our colleagues in the region. And you would all understand that there are many and particularly difficult health challenges to be met across the region. So what I thought I'd do today is talk about uh, public health issues, particularly about chronic disease. And of course, my favorite subject, tobacco. Uh, Tobacco is absolutely my favourite subject and I've brought with me a small little show and tell object which we'll come to in a minute. I'm sure all of you are aware of this. And what I'd like to do, I suppose, is connect what we do domestically with uh, what we do globally. That didn't work. We have to turn it on probably. There you go. So what I thought I'd do today is to give you a bit of context, to talk about uh, where we stand on a number of these issues, to talk about what it is that we uh, do in a global context on two things in particular. Firstly, tobacco and then the broader work that's going on globally about chronic disease, non-communicable disease. Of course, we do a lot of work on communicable disease as well. We've had a major role to play in health emergencies and things such as uh, avian influenza, pandemic, etc. And that's probably the subject for another conversation. Let's have a little look at us, though, to start with when it comes to chronic disease. We know that the three things which we, in common with many other countries, confront as major issues in chronic disease are firstly and most importantly in my view tobacco, secondly obesity and thirdly issues around alcohol consumption, particularly risky alcohol consumption. 
We know uh, that if we could tackle these three things, uh, we would significantly reduce the burden of disease in our community. Uh, we would increase productivity. We would reduce uh, the costs of the pharmaceutical benefits scheme and people would bluntly live longer. So if we could do something about those three things, we'd be making uh, a major, major step towards improved health. And of course, we've done not badly on tobacco. If you look at the decline in smoking rates since the 1970s, and particularly uh, the number of people who smoked from early teenage years right through until regrettably lung cancer or some other uh, disease got them, uh, we've gone from 50 odd percent of adults down to uh, a really, really, I think, pleasing number, but not low enough, which is about 15 percent. So we've made major strides in actually tackling tobacco consumption. We know, of course, that half of those who smoke regularly will die from the effects of smoking. In middle age, not in old age, and usually from something very unpleasant, cancer, stroke, emphysema. So this is not something that we would wish on even our worst enemy. And we also know that if you actually think about the costs to the community of tobacco smoke, they are significant. Think about what we could do with that additional productivity, that additional money in our economy, if it wasn't being consumed by lost productivity and additional health cost as a consequence of smoking. Similarly and regrettably, we have an obesity problem. And obesity is a significant drain on our economy. And it's a sad statistic, but the fact that we rank with the United States and the United Kingdoms amongst the communities with the highest levels of obesity uh, anywhere in the world, so not just in the Western world, anywhere in the world, that is not a statistic of which we should be proud. Similarly, the impact on health costs and particularly issues such as diabetes as a direct consequence of obesity are a major drain on our economy and also they actually have a significant impact on people's lives. So, finally alcohol. In terms of the impact of alcohol, and we need to make a distinction here between the harmful effects of alcohol and moderate regular consumption. And I do think it's important to make a distinction here between tobacco and alcohol. Tobacco, no level of tobacco consumption is good for you. Uh, but the reality is, if you read the NH and MRC guidelines, uh, it is the case that moderate consumption of alcohol does not bring with it the same risk and the same costs. But if you look at the harmful impacts of alcohol, they are significant. Uh, crime, healthcare costs, lost productivity. So these are the significant issues that we are tackling domestically. We've done this in a number of ways. Anyway, the numbers you can see up here, the numbers, are, and this is in Australia. So these are the, the impacts that we have. So if you say to yourself, all right, what, what therefore must be the effects of these uh, issues if you actually look globally? So we live in a, a highly literate, uh, health conscious mostly society where government is prepared to spend and invest on public health measures to tackle these issues. I could go on at some length about all the things that we've done in this context but I won't because what I want to do is talk to you a little about what some of the issues are uh, when you actually look globally at these issues. Globally these are major major drags on economies on the productivity of individuals, people's capacity to live long, uh, fulfilling lives. These are genuine issues around social justice. These are genuine issues of development. So if you think about what I outlined at the beginning, which is Australia's proud track record, not just of doing things in our own backyard and saying, well, we don't really care about what happens elsewhere. In the context of our tradition, which is not just to work domestically, but to engage globally, uh, you can see that what we are tackling globally is very, very significant. We know globally that tobacco uh, still causes huge numbers of deaths. Five uh, to six million people die globally 
every year from the effects of tobacco. And whilst we, in common with other Western countries, have really, I think, started to get the message through about the harmful effects of tobacco, that is not the case in many other countries. And one of the things I want to do is talk to you a bit today about global tobacco and its appalling behaviour. And what we know is that the tobacco epidemic is in the upswing in a whole series of countries, China, India, Indonesia. Think about the populations of those countries and think about the burden that that brings to communities that do not have the level of health system that we do and communities that do actually not have the capacity to provide the kind of care that we do even for our now relatively small tobacco smoking population. It's important, I think, to understand that one billion smokers live in the low to middle income countries and that their consumption continues to increase. Now, it's important also to understand that what we know about the adoption of tobacco smoking is that if you haven't taken it up by the age of 26, you won't. And the large, large, large majority of people who are going to take up tobacco smoke do it before the age of 18. So this tells you who it is tobacco companies are marketing to. What they're doing is they're actively targeting kids in order to get them to initiate smoking. And certainly globally, this is one of the things that we are very, very active on. I'm going to come back to that in a second. To give you a bit of a feeling for how this actually uh, uh, is reflected in this country, Basically, 15-year-olds um, who describe themselves as smokers, girls at 15, it's 8.9%, and for boys, it's 5%. If you look at people who smoked in the last uh, month, for girls, it was 15.8, and for boys, it was 11%. And by the time they get to 17, those numbers have risen, risen to 17.7 and 18.8. Now, think, if you will, that I've just told you that our our smoking rate is 15%. You see my point? So basically the tobacco companies have got people by the time they are 18. Some of those kids do not go on or they give it up very early. Uh, they have a partner or whomever who beats it out of them quite early. Um, I think we can all think of kids we know where that's been the case. But what that tells you is uh, where people are marketing. Now, if you look globally and what happens in uh, developing countries where the regulations around their activity are nowhere near as stringent as ours, it is blatant. It is absolutely blatant about marketing to kids in order to get them to initiate. Uh, as a bit of an aside, and I thought you would be interested to know that, uh, and some of you, and I'm going to talk a little bit about the trade dispute. Uh, which has been brought on us by the Ukraine, who is, of course, a well-known trading partner of Australia. Um, I can tell you that we trade about $37 million worth of, I suspect, vodka made out of potatoes and tra tractor parts, certainly no tobacco products. They've taken us to the WTO as part of our plain packaging initiative. I can tell you that in the Ukraine, 52% of men smoke. I can tell you that in Ukraine, interestingly, only 11% of women smoke. But if I asked you to guess how many boys aged 15 smoke, hands up who reckons it would be 10%. Hands up who think it might be 20%. Hands up who think it might be 30%. 40, yeah, you're getting close. 40% on the money. 40% of 15-year-old boys in the Ukraine smoke. Tells you everything. Anyway, that's an aside. Globally, obesity. And again, this is really significant, that obesity rates globally have doubled since 1980. And let's understand that obesity is not just an affliction of the developed world. It is regrettably the case that in some developing countries, uh, we are not only afflicted by a range of communicable diseases, including neglected tropical diseases, but at the same time, they're also taking on affluent Western lifestyle diseases that come from obesity. And it is certainly the case uh, that if you look around our neighbourhood in the South Pacific, that the combined burden of uh, obesity and some of the challenges of development together with things such as malaria really are placing a significant birth, uh, burden on those communities. We know, according to the WHO, that 43 million children under the age of five are overweight. 
in 2010. 43 million children around the world. And again, what do we know about overweight? Uh, the risk factors in terms of diabetes are right up there. And if you think about what we also know is that people who acquire weight in childhood, uh, they're often likely to carry that through life, which means the lifetime risk of developing diabetes is huge. And finally, if you look at the global burden uh, that I'm taking you through, take alcohol. And again, uh, what we've got here is 2.5 million deaths including a really scary number of young people who die from the effects of alcohol. So you can see that the things that we are tackling here in this country uh, are also significant and in fact in many of these developing countries a more significant burden than they are in Australia. So as part of our uh, good citizen of the world work we think it's really important that we engage and we also share the expertise and information and knowledge we have uh, with our friends and indeed our neighbours. So if you take just as a starting point uh, what we have been doing domestically because obviously the expertise and the information and the resources that we generate here domestically we also uh, then make available globally to global colleagues. Some of you would know that the Preventive Health Task Force, uh, which was commissioned by the government, uh, which came out with what could best be described as a very hard-hitting report about uh, the three risk factors for chronic disease and what would be the, some of the best buys in respect of government investment in tackling those uh, issues, has led to ongoing work and additional investment from government. Some of you would know about the National Binge Drinking Strategy. The, and I think we've got a rather charming graphic there, which came from our advertising campaign, Don't Turn a Night Out into a Nightmare, uh, which of course social marketing uh, was a key part of that campaign. And you would know that actually in terms of tackling these risk factors, social marketing is a very important element in our quiver of responses. We know that social marketing is relevant and does work when it comes to tackling these issues. We also know that we have to keep these things up. We know that we have to keep putting these messages in front of people so that people don't forget and go back to some of their old ways. You'd also know that there was a significant controversy around the tax that applied to alcoholic beverages and particularly to the so-called Alcopops tax. Um, for those who don't know these things, there was a, a significant discontinuity in the taxation arrangements, which actually meant that Alcopops were not taxed at the same rate, i.e. they were attractive to young people, sugary, sweet, easy to initiate the use of alcohol, and they were cheap. And so Nicola Roxon, who it was my absolute privilege to work with when she was Health Minister, uh, out delivering a wowzer message, and I kept saying to her, it's a good message, keep it out there, girl. And we were successful in actually having the alcohol pops tax passed and indeed it has made a difference to the consumption of alcohol amongst young people, a good thing. We've also done significant things uh, in terms of targeting hard to reach groups. Now the hard to reach groups uh, are firstly Indigenous peoples. And we know uh, that the smoking rate amongst Indigenous peoples in this country is not good. In some communities it is around 50%. So we've actually got a $15.5 million Indigenous tobacco control program. And what we're doing is we're rolling that initiative out right around uh, communities around our country. There are social marketing elements as part of that which are very much targeted at uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities. And particularly around the consequence of early death and the impact that has on family, it has on community and why it is that tackling smoking and giving up smoking is an important step that people can take in order that they actually can be around to see their kids grow up. We've also uh, done some things to tackle those teenage hard to reach girls. And when we did some research what we discovered is that girls don't like the notion of chemicals. And so we did a campaign that actually looked at the 4,000 chemicals which are actually in cigarettes. And what we discovered is that when you actually tell people there are chemicals in cigarettes which are just the same as the chemicals in Drano, the teenage girls went, yuck. 
And so we decided we'd also point out that there were chemicals in cigarettes that were like nail polish and a whole series of other unpleasant things. So it is important uh, that in this country we continue to tackle these preventable health issues. But probably one of the most important things I should talk about before I come to what we do globally, because this is highly relevant, uh, is not just the things uh, which you know about, uh, which are part of our regular ongoing approach. These are the more courageous things. And it's my favourite subject. And it is, of course, plain packaging. And if, you, if people would like to see it, I'll give it to Diane and I'll pass it around so you can actually have a look at the pack. But I would like it back, please. It's, it's well mangled. It's been to New York and back, that pack. Um, I've taken it to Singapore. Uh, I've taken it all sorts of places. We do have a very big one, but um, I've been required to send that to Margaret Chan at the WHO because <laughs> she wanted a copy. Our objective is to reduce tobacco smoke in this country to 10% by 2018. That's our objective. I'd like to get it down to zero, but I've got to have an intermediate objective, and my intermediate objective is 10%, and to halve the rate of smoking in our indigenous populations by two, the same year, 2018. One of the things uh, that we had in the uh, Preventive Health Task Force recommendations was that we should do something about tax, and you will know that the government put up in a single step the tobacco exercise by 25%, but it also recommended that we should actually adopt plain packaging. And you can see that plain is a bit of a misnomer uh, because actually it's anything but white uh, and sort of uniform. What it does is it increases the size of the uh, warning labels. It requires the tobacco companies to have their brand in a standard font. And it's coloured, and I could go on for hours about this, but I shan't. It's coloured in what we now describe as da drab green. But what you can see from that pack is it removes the last piece of sexy marketing that tobacco companies can use in this country uh, to basically promote their product. We know that this is an issue for them because they are fighting us tooth and nail. Uh, we've been in the High Court. The point at which Justice Crennan uh, objected to the tobacco company's description of uh, tobacco as being like Coca-Cola, and she actually drew the parallel with rat sack, um, we felt pretty good about that. We thought that was a good and positive sign because, of course, rat sacks are poisonous, so is tobacco. So how are we taking this kind of leadership uh, around the world? What we have done is show global leadership on tobacco. Uh, we show global, I'll come to the other things where we show global leadership in this area as well in a second, but I want to talk about the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control as being a very significant part of leadership that we have shown globally. And as I've said already, uh, we know that there are millions and millions of deaths globally as a consequence of tobacco. Uh, we spend, as a donor, hundreds of millions of dollars trying to assist developing countries to improve the health outcomes for their communities. Uh, we do this across the South Pacific. We do it in Asia. We do it in Africa. Why do we do this? Because we actually want people to improve their longevity, to have long, productive, healthy lives in communities which can grow economically and can therefore assist people to get out of poverty. Now, we know that if those people who we're otherwise attempting to assist uh, are smoking, that our efforts are basically discounted. We know that if people are smoking in those communities at the rates which we've talked about already, about 50%, uh, that we know there'll be significant deaths in the productive years and the health burden, the personal burden on communities will be huge. So the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control is actually the, the world's first public health treaty. Uh, the other one, and uh, for those who are interested, the WHO does have a capacity uh, to make treaties, and there is one other which is in respect of health emergencies. So this is very significant. One of the two uh, treaties made by this organisation is in respect of the global scourge on, of tobacco. It, I'm very proud that we, Australia, played a very significant role in the negotiation of this treaty. 
and it was negotiated over a four year period which concluded in 2003 and it came into force in 2005. And what this treaty does is provide a roadmap for countries in tobacco control. It doesn't prescribe when and what, but what it does do is talk about uh, the road that countries can follow. When I'm talking about uh, this uh, to global audiences, I talk about the range of things that people can do to tackle tobacco. Price and tax being obvious. Uh, thinking about protection from tobacco smoke. We now take it for granted we can walk into a restaurant and not have somebody puff in our face at the moment we have a fork full of food we're about to put in our mouths. Not so everywhere else. Uh, it was actually a particular pleasure I had when I was the President of the World Health Assembly to make an observation in my concluding remarks to the Assembly in 2007 about how it would be really terrific if the cantons of Switzerland would adopt uh, the given, this is where the WHO meets, uh, would adopt basically standard tobacco control measures. So when we were there meeting at the WHO, we didn't have to breathe in smoke while we were eating our dinner. I enjoyed telling that to the Mayor of the canton of Geneva. It is fair to say when I came back the next year uh, to DMOB as the president of the World Health Assembly, they had fixed it, which was good. The other things we talk to our global colleagues about is the regulation of product contents and disclosures. Things like packaging and labelling, uh, education, training, public awareness, uh, using uh, measures such as getting rid of sponsorship, of sporting events and, of course, importantly, things you can do in the community to deal with dependence and cessation. Now, of course, in this country, we take for granted the quit line. We take for granted now the fact that on the PBS, you can actually be prescribed and receive at either a low or no cost uh, a variety of uh, assistance to cease. We also talk about in the FCTC the importance of things such as preventing the sale of tobacco to minors. Uh, we talk about the economic alternatives to tobacco growing. All of these things are things that we in Australia helped negotiate globally. And it was a particular pleasure for me to actually sign the, the Treaty for Australia in New York. Um, it's again one of those seminal career moments where one gets to do something which you know is going to make a significant, a significant difference. The fact that uh, we have now taken this step on plain packaging is a very natural consequence of the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control. If you look at the kinds of measures that are mentioned, those measures uh, include measures around packaging. And when we talk to our global colleagues, we say you can't go there as the first measure, but you certainly can end up there. So we continue to stay very active in the FCTC. Finally, and I think it says down the bottom, um, we've also been awarded uh, the uh, Luther L. Terry Award for Global Tobacco Control, which is the American Cancer Society Award, which we're very proud of. It's worth just noting uh, that this is so significant because it was, will, we believe, make a difference. And if you look globally at where this work goes and what it is we're doing, you'll see that we're working with the UK uh, we're working with New Zealand, who have now both come out and indicated that they will follow our steps. So again, this is where global leadership is incredibly important. Uh, the, New Zealand has said they're going to do it, and the UK have put out a discussion paper. We're working with the, the countries that are listed there, Uruguay, Norway, uh, the UK and Canada, all of whom who are facing significant legal challenges to everything from uh, labelling uh, through to some of the broader health promotion work that they do. So we provide active technical assistance to those countries and we provide active legal assistance in terms of uh, having our lawyers to talk to theirs. Uh, the United States I regrettably just lost a case, a WTO case in respect of cloves in cigarettes. Um, we've actually got an active dialogue going on between our lawyers and their lawyers just in terms of what went wrong in that case because, as you can see there, uh, we actually already have several WTO actions against us, which as good citizens of the WTO we will basically participate in, uh, in an open and honest and meaningful way and we will explain why it is we're taking these steps for the benefit of our community and for the benefit of our citizens. 
We've also had an investor dispute notified to us. And for those who aren't uh, completely au fait with all things to do with trade, I should explain to you that we have a series of bilateral trade agreements with a whole series of countries. It is the case that um, Philip Morris, who in a move that could possibly be described as cynical, but I wouldn't be so bold, moved all its operations from Australia to Hong Kong um, some small number of months before it notified a dispute under the Hong Kong trade agreement with us. The notion that they may have been forum shopping, well, that would just be mere speculation on my part. The Hong Kong trade agreement is an old agreement. And it is fair to say that people who've written agreements more recently uh, understand much more about the possibility uh, that these agreements can be used for purposes for which they were not intended. So again, we are currently going through uh, the required processes under that bilateral agreement, uh, which actually require us to nominate arbitrators uh, and to basically hear the concerns of Philip Morris, brackets now Hong Kong, uh, about those issues. I think it's probably also worth pointing out uh, that our engagement generally on matters public health and non-communicable disease do extend beyond tobacco. Uh, sometimes it seems like all we do globally is tobacco, but we do do other things. It's important, I think, to understand that the work that the global health community does on non-communicable diseases, particularly in the development context, but more broadly than that, uh, has now been considered at the highest level globally. This work, uh, which came to a head at the UN General Assembly, which actually held its second ever global summit on a health issue, and the first one was on HIV AIDS. So the fact that uh, they decided to focus on NCDs as the second ever global summit, I think is highly significant. Those people in the global public health community, I think, were very, very pleased that the leaders of the world acknowledge that there are genuine issues for economic development, for global security, and just plain old human rights that come from issues around non-communicable disease. It was a very uh, significant global gathering of the great and the good from the, not just a public health perspective, but from aid donors, uh, from global uh, leaders in philanthropy, and from global leaders politically. And what that enabled us to do was to actually focus on the work that the WHO is doing on the strategy on diet and physical activity, and the strategy on alcohol, as well as the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control. And what that also means is that Australia has been able to talk with many people around the globe about the things that we know about what has worked for us. So not only do we make aid contributions to countries uh, who actually wish to take activity and action in these areas, but what we also can do is provide expertise and sometimes provide materials, including intellectual property, to assist countries. We do this by uh, having our experts sometimes go to countries to advise when they're actually looking to roll out global health programs. We provide our ads don't turn a night out into a nightmare, for example, but particularly our tobacco ads. We've provided those ads to many, many countries around the world who've asked. Um, I have seen those ads uh, used with uh, French voiceovers. I've seen them used with Spanish voiceovers. I've seen them used with Vietnamese voiceovers. And we figure this is very easy for us to do. We own the intellectual property. It's easy for us to authorise uh, other countries to use those ads as part of their activities. What we try and do is to continue to work in a multi-sectoral way in order to encourage governments around uh, the world to take action in each of these areas using the knowledge that is available to assist them. Now, I suspect many of you do know that there are global targets uh, in relation to a good number of these areas. Uh, we have targets in relation to things such as tobacco, salts, physical inactivity, all sorts of things that we are tackling here domestically. 
And we know that it is technically very difficult to implement uh, all of these things, and particularly it's hard sometimes to measure whether we've actually had any effect. So again, one of the things that we do is to actually assist in the measurement of these activities. So it's our privilege and it's also our pleasure to work in all the fora that we can find to assist other countries to tackle these issues. What we actually uh, say around our region is that we, uh, we want to help in any way that we can. Our friends and our neighbours in particular who lack resources, anything that we have that we can provide them with assistance, we're happy to give them. So if I give you a bit of a summary, where are we going next? Firstly, we domestically are determined to implement plain packaging. Uh, we've had the High Court hearing. We now wait for the High Court judgment, which we imagine will come in two to three years. So if you've not been following it closely, uh, basically the tobacco companies have tried to argue that we're acquiring their intellectual property and therefore we should be required to cease and desist with the legislation to implement pain packaging, which is due to take effect in December of this year. I am confident we will win that case. I am confident we will win. Uh, and therefore we will implement this legislation. We will continue the work that we're doing on alcohol and on obesity. Alcohol is hard, obesity is harder. Obesity uh, goes across the range of issues from environment to lifestyle, uh, even to have people understand that there are health consequences as a result of overweight is very difficult. Many people still think it's a body image thing and we should just get over it. So the challenge we have in convincing people, firstly, there's an issue to be tackled, and then secondly, assisting people to take steps to tackle these issues personally is not to be underestimated. But our objective is to not only do this domestically, but to support this work globally. We are going back on the board of the WHO. I'm going to my first board meeting uh, for this stint on the board in May and it'll be our pleasure to be able to assist our colleagues in taking these steps and particularly looking at the next tranche of work on physical activity and alcohol. What we want to do is to work actively towards the finalisation of the targets. Now the target work as I've already indicated is incredibly difficult. We know domestically targets give us something to focus on. So by saying that we by 2018 want to get smoking rates down to 10%, it really focuses the mind. What do we have to do to get there? But you can imagine that trying to negotiate global targets when many countries come from very different starting positions. Uh, I will say that the Ukrainian health minister is very supportive of anti-tobacco moves. Imagine if you were the Ukrainian health minister with a smoking rate amongst men of 50%. You've got a long way to go. So the same target may not be, and with the same timeline, may not be as appropriate for the Ukraine as it is for us. But what we all need are targets that stretch and challenge us to improve outcomes in our community. And of course, uh, then the World Health Assembly in 2013 will be considering uh, these issues in some detail. So what's driving all of this? Oh, I've gone too far. What's driving all of this? I will remind you, it's very simple. Millions of deaths a year from tobacco. Millions of deaths a year from the adverse effects from alcohol. And the obesity in 200 to 300 million people with that rate increasing on a daily basis, which we know will lead to a global burden of disease, which people uh, can say now will cause real effects in terms of the development agenda, will cause real effects in terms of uh, global well-being, And we also know that if we take steps to tackle this, that we can basically ma make sure and help people to have much longer and more productive lives. So I've given you a very brief Cook's tour of some of the things we're doing domestically 
and some of our engagement globally. I could talk for hours and hours and hours and hours about any one element of this, but we don't have that time. And I did promise Diane we'd leave a bit of time for questions. So there endeth the lesson. <laughs> Thank you. And, and I do think it's, it's a really important question. Uh, some of you would be aware of um, the, global, uh, the um, social determinants of health work that have been done and uh, the very clear evidence about social context and all the things that drive uh, behaviours which come from context. We certainly have had long conversations and have been attempting over some years to look particularly at the relationship between people with dual diagnosis, uh, so substance abuse, mental illness uh, and the relationship that and we all know that people with mental illness have much higher rates of tobacco use uh, than other communities and when I talked about the uh, going to more subpopulations that is exactly my point we now know that we've probably got a lot of the low-hanging fruit when it comes to giving people to give up tobacco smoke uh, people who are you know nice middle-class people you rarely see people from certain communities smoking these days. We know that those sorts of behaviours are located in particular communities and hence my point about what we're doing with the Indigenous community to try and tackle that quite explicitly. So yes, we're very conscious of it. Finding mechanisms and new modalities to tackle those issues is very hard. One of the things we did with the Indigenous uh, initiative was to actually hire, and we are hiring, Indigenous tobacco workers because working with individuals in their community context, we think is going to be much more efficacious for this particular community group than just relying, and it's not really just, but you know what I mean, on the social marketing approaches and the cessation assistance that we have on things like the pharmaceutical benefits scheme. So aware of it, uh, taking early steps. I think the evidence is a bit of a weakness here in terms of what's actually going to work um, and anything people want to tell me about that I'd be very interested to hear. I think there's a counting issue because I think there is more going on on the prevention end uh, across the broader health system which doesn't necessarily get classified in that way. Yeah, so I think, I think it is probably not fair to say our expenditure is restricted to just a fraction below 2%. I think it's actually much higher than that. I think in any, go back to evidence, uh, in any case I take to government now about funding, I have to have a solid evidence base behind it. So what I have to do, so when I went uh, on the tobacco initiatives, particularly around uh, Indigenous peoples, I had some evidence on which I founded that and then I had the particular problem I was trying to tackle. Uh, when we do the work that we're doing on diabetes, Again, we've been able to get investment in because we can actually demonstrate the cost effectiveness and the cost benefit of uh, particular measures and then tackling uh, that problem. And in some cases, I have to go and argue for a trial. So I get monies that can trial things. If I get the evidence from the trial, then I can actually get investment in. So I think, I think to say I'm just going to get a bucket of money with the label prevention on it, that's not going to happen. It's not how budgeting works these days. And Lord knows the Commonwealth budget's next Tuesday. And, you know, it's been a tough couple of months. So there, there is no magic pudding. I say to people, I, I wish I had a magic pudding under my, de be my desk, but I don't. But what I can do is make evidence-based arguments, and particularly where they generate outcomes which will come in this case from prevention, then I can make those arguments. So one, I think the number's not right. Two, we're on, this, we're on the game. But, but, but let's be clear, um, whilst there is no evidence specifically about plain packaging itself, there is a lot of evidence about uh, what appeals to young people there's a lot of evidence that surrounds that initiative, uh, which makes, if you add all of that up, 
and we've made this case very clearly in a whole series of courts recently, uh, that evidence is very clear about what we believe will be the impact of something like pain packaging. So yes, you're right, it has to appeal to politicians, but I do think we need to be a little careful by saying, by saying well, there wasn't evidence for that. Was there was a lot of evidence around it. Sorry, I probably interrupted you. The thing about getting governments to take decisions, you can have all the evidence in the world, but if it's not compelling, you won't get them to take the decision. And you can have all the evidence in the world, but sometimes an anecdote is worth a thousand learned journal articles. And I have... <laughs> I want the thousand learned journal articles as my backup. I want to be able to say, the evidence on this is extraordinarily, compellingly, totally clear. And I do say that. But let me tell you, Minister, Prime Minister, whomever, let me tell you what this means to the individual. Let me tell you what this means to a family whose sole breadwinner has cancer at the age of 42. Let me tell you, it's that stuff which then makes it real. And remembering that you have different audiences and what is compelling for one audience may not be compelling for another. And so the challenge, the trick actually, and I'm not telling any stories because I'd have to shoot you all, um, but I can tell you that on a number of occasions, uh, it is the anecdote that has won the argument because the evidence gives you the platform to get in the room. It is, absolutely, and there are a whole series of things, but in my view, uh, it will be a continuation of the strategies I've talked about, price, um, uh, social marketing. I think the big issue we have to tackle with alcohol is actually the social norms around alcohol myself. Now, you're right, the NH and MSC guidelines are very clear, two standard drinks a day. Now, let's be clear, if you look at the risk graphs, this is not a zero risk, sudden risk. Uh, it, it's, you know, it's a gradation. But in terms of where they, uh, and this was much evidence based on, I can tell you, much argued through. That's why the, the and we're talking standard drinks people, we're not talking um, a bistro glass of wine, which is probably one and a half to two. Uh, so standard drinks of alcohol. But I do think we have to keep talking about what is not acceptable behaviour. And I actually think we're starting to see a little bit of a shift. I, I do think when Nanny Nicola started on the Alco Pops, this is, unacceptable. When people started talking about the violence and the consequences of drinking, the actual physical harms that come from that much alcohol consumption, I think that has started to prick the consciousness. But exactly as I said with tobacco, we have to keep that up. It's going to take a while. This, we've developed this problem over a number of years and we've got to keep it up. So, so um, we do work very closely with our international colleagues, particularly on things like obesity. Um, I have to say that no one else has actually found the magic bullet for this yet, which is why we're sharing evidence and information. Um, obviously, there are big disputes and debates about advertising to children. There are a whole series of disputes and debates about the amount of physical activity people have, particularly in the context of school. Um, there are all those sorts of debates, and we're actively learning from that. Uh, in terms of all of this work, it is one big global goldfish bowl. And it's important that we are in that global goldfish bowl with our eyes well open and that in addition to us providing what we've got, we take from others and that's certainly what we do. Certainly what we do. Okay.